I'm Tom Morrow, and this is a special edition of Living Legacies. We're at the home of Victor Villasenor, one of the oldest homes in Oceanside, which one time used to be known as North Carlsbad. It's, uh, it's his parents' home. They built it in 1945, and it's one of the most gorgeous locations you could ask for anything. We're going to go in and visit with Victor for a while. Victor? Great. Let's go sit down at your patio and visit for a while. Well, Victor, you uh, I know you were quite young when your parents built this place in 1945. You were, what, three and a half years old when you moved Well, when we moved here from Carlsbad when I was three and a half. By the time we started building it, I was five. So I remember, I remember them building the house very, very well. So as, as a... As a writer, a well-known writer, uh, Thomas Wolfe was wrong. You can go home again because you've never left. Yeah, I've, I've been here all my life. <laughs> now, uh, tell me about your parents. Uh, what, uh, uh, where did they come from? What did they do for a living? Well, my father is from Los Altos de Jalisco, which is in central Mexico near Guadalajara. And he was raised on a ranch with cattle and horses way, way up in the mountains. A yeah, little tiny rancherita. Now, my f mother was born in northern Mexico in the Copper Canyon, like Barranca de Cobre, in a gold mining town that was owned by an American company. And uh, her mother made meals there and sold breakfast to the miners. And both of my parents were children of the revolution. When the revolution started, my father was 10 years old and he saw his brothers and sisters. He was the 19th child. Mm -hmm. Born his mother when she was 50. And she, now this is the revolution of 1910? Right, 1910. And so he was seven years old when it started. And, and uh, three years into the Mexican Revolution, he was the only male child left. They were all killed and beaten and everything destroyed. It, it, it was just, you know, revolution's a horrible thing. All wars are horrible. Now when did they come to the United States? My father came to the Texas border about 1915, and uh, they crossed over in El Paso. He crossed over with his mother and two sisters, and they were starving to death. Now, my mother came after the revolution in 1923, and they had stayed behind at the gold mine and done a lot of mining on their own. So they came over with little bits of gold and sewed into their seams their dresses so they actually had a little money and it wasn't so hard for them to and they crossed over here at the Arizona border. Uh -huh. when, when did your parents first meet? They met in Carlsbad. My father uh, was a bootlegger. They met in 19... see they married 1929, August 1929 so they met two years before that, 1927 and my father was uh, partners with the local law. My father said if you're ever going to do something illegal it's best to be in partnership with the local law. <laughs> and he was in partnerships with Archie Freeman and a couple of the judges in the area. And uh, As This is back during Prohibition? Right, right. Uh, and he made liquor over in, in uh, Lake Elsinore. He learned how to make liquor in, in jail in Tulare from an Italian guy that had been brought over from Italy to make... Is this what they call moonshine or white lightning? Uh, well, well, it's better than that. Clear. It was really, really good stuff. This Italian guy was shipped over from Italy to make it for the mafia out of, Sacra out of uh, Fresno that sold to San Francisco, Sacramento, everywhere. <laughs> it, it was so your dad like, learned from the best. Oh, absolutely. And then you went to L.A., and he said there was a place where you could buy the empty bottles, uh -huh. and you could fill them up, and they sold all the, all the equipment you needed, and the needle for aging it. Uh -huh. You could make 12-year-old whiskey in six hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, so how long, uh, so I, I assume your dad was rather successful at that, if, if he oh, yeah. uh, was in league with the law. Yeah, my father drove a, a Moon automobile, and, and he... Uh, was selling liquor in Carlsbad at, uh, in the pool hall there and he said there were all these people, young people lined up to go into the dance hall across the street and a fight started and he saw some of the girls getting excited by the fight but then he saw this one girl that wasn't excited by it, and she withdrew and she was very elegant and she, he saw that she didn't like fighting and he liked that because people that like fighting are crazy. He'd seen too much war as a kid 
And then the moonlight hit her, and he said she was the most beautiful creature he'd ever seen. Then she saw him seen, looking at her, and she turned away and got the arm of the person next to her. So uh, a few weeks later, he found out that was her brother. <laughs> so he started courting her without her even knowing it. How did he do that? Well, he said what you do is you, you court the brother, and you become friends with him. Then you try to help get the friends. Uh, and then uh, they were working in the fields, and the foreman there was reading comic papers. He was a big, heavy-set guy and was bullying the Mexicans, and they weren't allowed to drink water they had until lunchtime. And they just kept him working and working like slaves. And her father uh, was passing out, so she took him to give him water, and the guy said no. So my father came around and hit him real hard, and then hit him in the gut, the foreman, and then took a bottle of whiskey out and poured it all over his throat so to show that he'd, so that the, they'd think he was a drunkard. Yeah. And almost killed the guy with ramming the bottle down his throat. So then uh, all, he told all the people to come in and drink, and he became a hero, and my mother admired him. And, <laughs> but his father, looking under the truck, had seen that my father shoved the liquor in the guy's bottle in the guy's mouth. And the guy's yelling at the boss, I, I don't drink, I don't drink. And he had liquor all over him, so he got fired. <laughs> so your parents married, and uh, did your, of course, when Prohibition ended, that kind of ended your dad's uh, career as a bootlegger. Completely. And, and what happened was, in the book, uh, 13 Senses, I show my after the marriage. See, Raina Gold, my first book, shows my parents coming from Mexico, finally courtship, meeting each other, and getting married, and the book mm -hmm. ends there. Then, now, this is your best-selling uh, uh, novel, or, or is it really a, isn't a novel, even though the publisher calls it. We'll talk about that later. But It's nonfiction, but it reads like a novel. This is your second book? Well, Reign of Gold was, was the first of the trilogy, uh -huh. and it came out in 1990, and uh, it takes them up to getting married. You know, the family's coming from Mexico, then coming together, and then getting married. Mm -hmm. the, the next book which is uh, 13 Census, starts the day after they get married. And they move from Santa San Ana, where they got married, to Carlsbad. And the house they moved into is right where the post office is now. You know the big post office oh, down? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. And they, they had rented a house in an orchard there, owned by some German people. And it shows their life there. And see, my father lied to my mother about everything. He said he was a fertilizer mover. He didn't drink alcohol. He didn't gamble. Because she hated all those things. <laughs> and and, and uh, the book starts off with the 50th anniversary right inside the house here. And, 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 my, and the grandkids asked my mother, you know, would you marry him knowing him in the way you know him now? And, and she said, no. <laughs> he lied to me about everything. I wouldn't marry him. And then they asked him, would you... Marry her knowing grandmama the way you know. And he said, of course. He said, would you lie to her again? He said, how else does a man catch an angel? <laughs> oh, what a wonderful, wonderful story. <laughs> how else does a man catch an angel? And she was an innocent 18-year-old girl. He was a 25-year-old bootlegger, gun-carrying guy that had been to jail, had been to prison. and A man so of the world. Yeah, you know, they were completely worlds apart. Well, what... The I, we'll talk about 13 Census later, but how did you come up with the title Reign of Gold? That's the name of the gold mining town my mother was born in. It, it's called Reign of Gold, La Lluvia de Oro. Supposedly a meteorite hit the earth, shattered a chunk of cliff off, and gold was raining down the mountain with, with water trickling on it. And that's the way the Americans found it, and the Indians found it before the Americans. And they used to call it the Reign of Gold. Oh. Great. So it's a true. St the stories in the books are so incredible that they have to be true. I, I couldn't make stuff up like that. Well, what? Uh, how many? Uh, how many brothers and sisters do you have? I had uh, one brother. He passed away when I was eight years old, and I have three sisters now. An older sister, ten years older, that she saw my father during those horrible days of bootlegging and running from the law. Then my brother died, so that I became the oldest. I was the youngest, and I became the oldest. And then I have two younger sisters. Mm -hmm. And my younger sisters, they, they don't know anything about growing up in the barrio of Carlsbad. They were born here on the ranch. 
so they know about this house and about this life here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, there was a time when people uh, identified more with Carlsbad in this particular area, the Fire Mountain area, and, and where you are. Yeah. You identified more with Carlsbad than you did with Oceanside. Well, back then, we were, we were always on the Oceanside side, but right down, down the street in California here, just about a quarter of a mile, half a mile, that was all Carlsbad. Then across the freeway, that was all Carlsbad. So uh, the lines have moved several times over the years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where did you go to school? I went to school uh, at the Dittmar. It doesn't exist anymore. Not the, not the present Dittmar school, but an old one up there in, in uh, Oceanside. I went there for two years, no, three years, kindergarten, first, second grade. Then I went to uh, South Oceanside School here, and I went here two, three years. Then my parents sent me to Catholic school. I'm dyslexic. I, I was having trouble reading. Like, I, I flunked the third grade twice. Well, I was going to say that school for you was not a pleasant experience. Oh, it was horrible. It was, it was, it was In those horrible. days, they didn't know what dyslexia was. Uh, what? Dyslexia. No, they, they just hit me on the head and called me stupid. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, what did your, your dad, he ran a business in Carlsbad while you were, while this was going on, while you were in school? Well, what happened was after he got out of bootlegging, he bought the pool hall in downtown Carlsbad from Archie Freeman. Now, where is that located? What building is that today? It'd be on the corner of Walnut and Roosevelt. There's a grocery store there now. Uh-huh. And across the street, they have a little museum, and then Behind the museum, there's an abandoned building there called, you can still barely see the outline, it says Sal's Pool. Uh-huh. And, uh, and your dad is named Salvador? Yeah, uh-huh. Salvador. So, so by the time I was started school, my father, they had a liquor store in downtown Carlsbad, one in downtown Oceanside, and then they got another one. Mm-hmm. My, my, my father, uh, at that time, see, grocery stores and Drugstores didn't sell liquor. Only liquor stores could sell liquor. So they were, they were a real money-making business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, now, getting back to, uh, getting back to your school, um, when you, uh, what, what is it like to be dyslexic? What, explain to the folks who have no clue about what that's like. And I know it's a, it's a terrible thing to happen, and well, there's a lot of kids that have suffered with it. Well, when it, I started knowing that something was wrong with me about the second grade. Because in the first grade in kindergarten, they'd read to us and I could follow the stories. And, you know, Mary sees Spot, Spot sees Mary, and, and I got that. But as soon as we got into little bigger sentences in second grade, I couldn't figure out which word was which. Uh-huh. And I couldn't make a distinction between the and this. And by the time we got into third grade... I was lost. Did, did you talk to your parents, or was there anyone you could go to? to no, ex- no. I, I thought something was wrong with me, so I didn't want anybody to know. So I kept so it secret. was something you were, you felt ashamed of, like like bedwetting. Yeah, uh-huh. and and I was like I was very scared. It, it would make me so nervous. I used to wet my bed until I was about twelve, thirteen years old, and 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 that's a horrible. You don't go around telling the world about yeah. it. So I never told my parents, and and. Uh, I knew that I was going to be called on the next day at school to read because they went down the line alphabetically. Well, I would go to the bathroom so I wouldn't be called on. Then I'd change places with people. And I had this whole secret world going on so I would never be found out that I couldn't read. You had read. a system. You, you were able to beat the... Well, I didn't beat it because they'd catch me and the, or the nun would have me stand up and tell me to read and I'd refuse to read because I knew I didn't know how. Mm-hmm. So then they'd slap me or hit me or of course that didn't help any well I would rather I would rather be punished than be called stupid so by the time I was uh, in the fifth grade it was it was it was it was horrible well they thought you were incorrigible or just just couldn't learn they thought I was mentally slow plus that I wouldn't cooperate, but but it was way more. That I knew a lot less than they thought I did. Well, when the scholars and there there have been legions of scholars have read your books on your heritage and and the stories that you tell, does anybody? It's hard to believe that you you had that that sort of. Basic I still education. have it. I still have it. I, I still 
cannot read in public. I still can't read in the afternoons when I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I, I, it, it, dyslexic is the way I view the world. See, let me show you another way. I learned chess in the seventh grade. I couldn't figure out how the pieces move, but once I caught it, I became chess champion of all the kids plus all the faculty. I could beat everyone. I went 100 games without losing in chess. And the thing about it is I could think, I could see things, but I, I couldn't hold the words on the page. They still move. I see the lines between the words and they're moving around and I see the words moving and it's very hard for me to stay focused. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about how you write and how you put, uh, weave your stories uh, a little bit later. But uh, until then, we're going to take a little tour of your beautiful house, and you can tell us a little bit about what uh, a little bit of the history of this home and uh, and some of the some of the artifacts and the pictures we'll see in it. If if we might, we'll go up and kind of show the folks around. You're your invited house. in. concludes the first half of our two-part series on best-selling author Victor Villasenor. But before we go, I'd like to show you a few scenes from his annual Snow Goose Global Thanksgiving that he has here on his ranch. Watch for the second half of our feature on Victor Villasenor here on Living Legacies. the past out of much suffering and embarrassment and anger and confusion an American author has written the story of how he came to be an American it's a story with some lessons in it for him and all the rest of us When we wake up with, we breathe and we relax and we wake up with energy, then we know anything is possible. Everything is possible. And I wrote one book in one night about world peace for the next 5,000 years. And it's simple. If we want peace, let's stop talking about it. We do it. We take one day, the celebration of Thanksgiving, where the Indians and the pilgrims, two foreign cultures ate together in peace and harmony and we go global with it. Giving this this pole into the ground, acupuncture to Mother Earth, and everybody that's here in healing and a massage knows what we're talking about. We're putting it into the earth. We, we fed the earth breakfast this morning, the Mother Earth. We did a ritual here and we gave her fruit. Now we're going to give her this with love. That's 22 karat gold with a ruby. And then all of you that have something that you absolutely love, you have to love it. You can 
put it as an offering. You put it yourself as an offering. And we put it into the earth. It's going to vibrate into the Mother Earth, down deep to her soul, and bring, come back and give us an abundance. is to present yourself to the fire because you will hear the voice yes or no but you will have heard it and it's not a dream it's not a fantasy it's a real voice and each of us has that voice is here with us. Everything is alive. Everything is right here. We make our own hell. We make our own heaven. We have free will. And we have the possibility to destroy ourselves or to resurrect ourselves. And it all comes to having the power of getting rid of doubt and fear and going into the world of abundance and love. Unconditional love. As the sun moves down, and let us know that each one of us is magic. We're absolutely magic. Breathe. When you walk in harmony, you walk with God. Every Native American language, God was a verb. This program is made possible through the generous underwriting grants of Hatter Williams and Pretty Insurance Services of Oceanside providing North County with complete insurance needs for more than half a century. The TriQuest Corporation, providing quality office and manufacturing space in Oceanside. And the North County Times, serving all of North County with complete local daily news coverage and internet services. <laughs>